Hello, everyone. Good to be with you again. I want us to start today by asking you to think about how much time you spend doing laundry. In my house, it can be like six loads every week. And that was, that's only after two of our adult children have left the house. It used to be more. I think about all that sorting, all of the loading into the washer, and then transferring to the dryer, pulling out of the dryer, the folding, more sorting, the putting away of clothes. Over and over we do this, load after load, week after week. And think about how many hours that represents, month to year after year after year, all because we are working hard to get clean clothing. Now, thank goodness, we don't have to do it by hand, like many people around the world still do, our ancestors did. We have our clothes dryers and our automatic washers, and they make things a lot easier. But even if it was a lot of work, clean clothing is worth the work. I mean, as much as we can grumble and complain about it, and as much as we might be tempted to put on that dirty clothing yet again, most of us would agree, I think, that clean clothing is great. It smells great, it looks great, it feels great. And in our continuing series through Colossians, the writer of this letter, the Apostle Paul, is talking about laundry. He's not talking about shirts and shorts and socks and undergarments. There's another kind of clean living that he says is vital for all of us. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. And you'll notice right away the word therefore. We've seen a couple of these over the last few weeks, and it just simply means that what he said before in the previous series of verses provides a rationale for what he's about to say now. So what did he say before? Well, if you scan ahead to the beginning of chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, Paul taught that we Christians identify ourselves as people who have been raised with Christ. That means that our, our old life is dead. We have a new life in Christ. And so, he says, we then actively focus our hearts and minds on things above. That means that we have new life in Christ in the here and now. I mean, we also have this wonderful hope of eternal life with him after we die. But the focus is on life here and now in these verses. How do we live that life now? Well, then he continued in verses 5 through 11, where he began to talk about laundry as, as a metaphor to help us live that new life now. And last week in verses 5 through 11, he basically said, take off the old dirty clothes. And, and what he meant by that is that followers of Jesus remove from their lives actions and attitudes of what he calls the old sinful or earthly nature. Well, this week we're at part two, and that is to put on clean clothes. And he first hinted at this if you scan back to verse 10, where he said, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And what Paul meant is that there's a renovation taking place in our lives. Our lives are being renewed, he says, specifically in knowledge. We're learning. We're learning a new way to live. And it's a very specific way. We don't get to decide what that new way looks like. Instead, Paul says, we're learning. There's a renewal of our knowledge taking place such that our new life is becoming more and more like the life of Jesus, that, that image of our creator. Our new life will, that mean, it'll look more like the way he lived. And furthermore, what happens then is it's not just contained to one person or just to individuals. In verse 11, he says it creates this whole new community. No longer do ethnicities or nationalities or skin color or uh, the fact that we might be enemies divide us. In Christ, we are a new community that's living a new way. We are the new community of the people who have taken off those old dirty clothes and are putting on the new clean clothes. 
And so let's read what he says about putting on those new clean clothes, starting in verse 12. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you see how Paul starts off in verse 12 describing this new community? He says they are God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved. Now clearly what he's saying is God has done the work of making this new community possible because he loves us, because he wants us to be holy. Now that word holy, that's a callback to chapter 1. There, he called the Christians holy. He used the word saints to describe them. And that might be a little bit confusing because you and I well know that there are times when we Christians are less than holy. And so there's a connection then with what Paul is talking about here in chapter 3. We are to pursue holiness because we died to that old way of living. And we're alive in Christ to this new way, his new way. And so therefore... We not only take off the old dirty clothes, we also put on the new clothes. We not only get rid of the actions and attitudes of the old sinful nature, we add in, we, we become new people of the new nature of Christ. And so that's what Paul's going to talk about. Well, what is that? What are those actions that mark those of us who are chosen, holy, and dearly loved? Well, in verse 12, he tells us that this is a command. Put on clothing. It's one of those imperatives that we've been talking about for the last few weeks. Put it on. Put on this clothing. And he gives us a list of the clothing. And I want to look at each word to help us describe what it means. And here's the first clothing, the first piece of clothing that he tells us to put on in verse 12. Clothe yourselves with intestines. You don't see that, do you? It's not there, at least in our English Bibles. In the New International that I'm reading, it's not there. But it's there. Kind of. You know how we use the word heart to describe, particularly love, but our, our feelings of emotions? We say, I love them with all my heart. Well, we don't mean that we love a person with this organ, this blood-pumping organ that's inside of us. Well, in the Greco-Roman era in which Paul was writing this letter, it was like almost 2,000 years ago, the intestines were used figuratively as the place where you would feel deeply. So that word, the, the place of inner feelings, is connected to the next word on the list, compassion. Now, in the New International Version, you, you don't really see the emphasis that Paul is making there. It just says compassion. The New, Inter or the New American Standard is much closer. It says, clothe yourselves with a heart of compassion. But as I said, Paul does not use the word heart. He uses the word for intestines. Literally, Paul says, clothe yourselves with intestines of compassion. Some people say it's called bowels of mercy. That's another way to translate it. Paul is saying here, clothe yourselves with an ability to feel compassion deeply. We Christians are to be people of compassion. Now, it seems to me that some people are just naturally more compassionate than others. For some of you, compassion, uh, mercy, they just flow out of you. For others of you, your personality has a hard time with this. So think about the teachers that you've had over the years. There were some of those teachers who we might call hardcore. They say, you get what you get and you don't get upset. You failed a test, you failed the test, done. 
But then there's those other teachers who are more compassionate. They might grade on the curve. They might give you the chance to retake the test. Christians are to clothe ourselves with compassion and mercy, like that second teacher. We are to keep in mind the astounding compassion and mercy that God had on us. Now, you might be thinking at this point, yeah, I agree with that. But when you give people compassion and mercy, they don't really learn from their mistakes. Really, though, I have to ask, is that true in every instance that show no mercy is always best? Or no. I mean, thank God that he is a God of mercy. And so we, too, are to be a people clothed with compassion and mercy. In my volunteer role in our denomination, the Evangelical Congregational Church, I direct something called the Institute for Christian Leadership. It's a program of 12 Bible and ministry courses, and a person can finish them if they do them one right after the other in 12 years. Anyone can take the classes, and I encourage people to consider this. They're really, really great. It's almost like a community college level, um, except you're, you're studying the Bible and ministry. Now, we ask pastors in our denomination who don't want to go to seminary, don't want to get ordained, and, and you know, because that's a very extensive and expensive process. We ask them to take these ICL courses. Well, this past week, I was involved in a conversation about one of our pastors in those courses who wrote a paper for one of the classes. And the paper really criticized our denomination's approach to the specific spiritual gifts that Paul writes about in another letter, Ephesians chapter 4. Well, I disagreed with this pastor's interpretation of Scripture, but I supported his right to have an opinion that's different than mine. What I took issue with, with was his tone, his attitude. In my opinion, this was not the first time this particular person expressed himself in a way that came across as condescending and arrogant, pompous. Maybe you know a person like that. It is super hard to have compassion, to have deep mercy on that kind of a person but we are called to clothe ourselves with compassion, even to people who are difficult for us. Now, that doesn't mean that we just let them get away with sin. Compassion is not excusing sin, as if we say that we just throw compassion on the situation and all the consequences are dealt with. No, and that's not what God did when he showed us compassion and mercy. Think about it. Jesus took consequences upon himself, didn't he? God also allows us to face the natural consequences of our decisions. So that's where I think we can get confused in thinking about how compassion works. Compassion is having an attitude of, of graciousness and mercy to a person. Too often, when people get frustrating or difficult, we write them off. We're sick of them. We say things like, I am so done with them. Compassion fights against those attitudes, but it does not mean that we don't set boundaries. It means instead that we speak the truth to them in love. So deep compassion really is a tricky balance, and yet it is a must for, for Christians. Next, Paul says something very similar. Clothe yourselves with kindness. This is speaking and acting in kindness, and it's really similar to compassion, I think. Kindness, though, should show in our tone of voice, in our generosity, in our care for people. When Michelle and I were in Bible college, every year before the spring semester started, the whole student body had to come back to campus a week early for a required mission conference. And for a couple years, we would take one afternoon of that mission conference and everyone would go out into the community to do what was called random acts of kindness. Students would have a bag of quarters and they would pay for parking meters for people in the city. Um, they might clean toilets at a restaurant. They might collect trash 
all kinds of things like that. It was fun. But here's the thing, kindness, it's not supposed to be random. God is not random. His kindness to us is absolutely intentional. It's purposeful. It is on the ready in our tone of voice, in our actions to express ourselves with that gentleness, that compassion, that kindness, even for people who are difficult for us. The next thing Paul says, clothe yourselves with humility. Now, again, this is both an attitude and action. In my doctoral classes, all these books I had to read, it was fascinating how often humility came up. It, it came up so often to the point where I, I am fairly convinced that humility is the second most important quality that Christians can demonstrate in their lives. Peek ahead, look at verse 14. There you see the first, the most important one, and that's love, and we'll get to that. But humility is not far behind. It is, its value, its impact is vital. Humility is the opposite of arrogance. Remember that student who wrote that paper criticizing our denomination? He left no room in his paper for the possibility that he might be wrong in any way. He comes across, therefore, as a, as a know-it-all. As a person who does not give any impression that he is aware of other ways of thinking. Instead, he communicates as if his view is the only view. And he, he makes it sound like his view is so obviously the only view that that's it. Does that describe you? To that, Paul says, clothe yourselves with humility. Leave open room for the possibility that you might be wrong. Fight against arrogance. Even if you don't believe you're wrong, humility says that you should make room for that possibility. I mean, it's the definition of humanity, isn't it? That we are fallible. And we need to make room for that. We need to be aware of that. We need to do the work of making it clear that we see that in ourselves. Years ago, I was having a discussion with a person about my preaching. They claimed that I was missing out on some things and their perspective was 100% right. And so I responded, I just simply asked them, are you telling me that there is no chance that your viewpoint is even slightly wrong? They confirmed that they believed there was no possibility that they were wrong. I was astounded. We went back and forth about this until finally they admitted that there might be a possibility that they were 1% wrong. 1% possibility, I mean. Well, the meeting was over. I thought it finished well. We expressed our, our friendship. We even hugged. And the person walked out the door of my office and they never came back. I think what people like that person fear is a wishy-washy faith. And there's an element of that I agree with. They might say something like, yeah, but aren't there foundational truths that we Christians hold to? Aren't there times when it's important to say that we are 100% right about that? Yeah, I think there are those times. But let's remember that those foundational truths are very few and far between. For example, a couple years ago, there was a non-Christian church that started up in, here in our Conestoga Valley area. Well, our churches in the ministerium talked about this. What would we do if that non-Christian church asked to participate in our ministerium? Every ministerium church is a Christian church. So we felt that we needed to create a document that all of our churches could agree on to say what we held in common and that the ministerium was specifically Christian. As we wrote that document, we wrestled with how much do we need to agree upon? We purposefully kept it very short, trying to focus on those absolute essentials that Christians need to believe. But even those foundational beliefs we are called to hold with humility of attitude, humility of tone. And what can be so difficult is when people begin to elevate non-essentials to the level of essential. 
can be so difficult when there are disagreements in a church family about what those are. It can be difficult when there's disagreements in a family or in a workplace. Paul says, clothe yourselves with humility. We are to hold our opinions with humility and not arrogance. And so what do we do with that? How do we do that? We'll take a look at the very next word on the list. This next piece of clothing is gentleness. Like the others, this refers to both a, an attitude and our behavior. It's the opposite of harsh. It is speaking softly. It's, it's not raising one's voice. Tone of voice is a powerful thing. In fact, communication scientists tell us that the words we speak actually carry far less significance than the nonverbals that we use. Body language, facial expressions, tone of voice. And the classic example of this is when someone might say to another person in a very angry tone, I love you. What message gets sent? It's not love. In fact, the message that gets sent is the exact opposite of what the words communicate. That's how powerful tone can be. It's not just words, though. Gentleness should be expressed in our behavior. Now, Paul is not saying that we Christians should somehow be these mamby-pamby doormats. But we should avoid being harsh. Harsh tones and actions can be manipulative. They can be damaging. Some people, and maybe some of you, have learned how to use harshness to your advantage. Some of you maybe are even experts at it. Paul is saying you need to confess and repent. Instead, clothe yourselves with gentleness. Finally, he's got one more piece of clothing in verse 12. He says, clothe yourselves with patience. Patience is a state of emotional calm in the face of provocation or misfortune and without complaint or irritation. That's how the dictionary defines it. I often think about what my 16-year-old self would think of our world in 2021. Obviously, a lot is still the same. But there are some very noticeable differences. Now, do you, how many of you remember back then mail order catalogs? You'd flip through the catalog, you'd see what you want to order, uh, you would fill out the order form, then you would send it in the mail along with your check, and you would wait. Now, sometimes you could call it in on the phone, but normally you'd have to wait. Delivery could often be six to eight weeks. Now, I'll have to admit, I think about the 1980s, 1990s, and the way our society was then. I think, what could possibly have taken them six to eight weeks? Now, though, Amazon Prime. You order something, and it's there sometimes in 24 hours, 48 hours max. Their blue trucks are all over the place. It's amazing. Waiting six to eight weeks? How many of us would say, I have no patience for that? Thing is, we say, I have no patience about a great many things. We're a culture of impatience. We have to wait in the Chick-fil-A drive through for a half hour and we think the world's going to fall apart. This is especially so because of the internet. We have been trained to just Google it and have our response, have our information immediately. We want to know something fast. We have been trained to expect immediacy. And thus, we have a really difficult time waiting. We Christians, Paul says, are to be clothed with patience. You know the saying about patience. If you pray for patience, get ready to deal with a situation that's going to force you to be patient. COVID, for example, this has been a massive test in patience. Here's the thing. Patience, though, is not just being forced to wait. Patience is learning the right way of waiting. It is waiting with gentleness, waiting with graciousness. Just like that definition said, learning to wait without complaining and irritation. Here's another way to look at patience. Christians are called to be people who need not be in a hurry. We are people who radically combat hurry in our lives. That's a hard one for me. Like right now, I want to be done with my dissertation. And it feels like it's going way too slow. How about you? Do you struggle with patience? Clothe yourselves with patience. 
Now, as I said, that's the last one on the list. But is Paul done talking about the, the clothing that we are to put on? I don't think so. Look at verse 13. He says now, bear with others and forgive just as God forgave you. Well, that's very similar to some of the clothing that he's already talked about. I mean, if we're people that have compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, we will bear with people. We'll forgive them. Now, Paul is not saying that this is all easy stuff. He's simply saying this is what we do. It might mean that we have to work hard at it, and it might feel like a struggle, but it is what we do. Husbands and wives, bear with each other and forgive. People in a church family, Bear with each other and forgive. Parents with children and children with parents, bear with each other and forgive. A pastoral colleague of mine a few years ago felt convicted that his congregation had not done this. That they had not practiced putting on the clothing of bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And it was about how they had handled a specific difficult situation in their church family. Now, the event, this difficult event, it took place right at the beginning of that pastor's tenure. In fact, the situation had already been going on before he even got hired. And it took place, the, the, the finality of it all, the, it hit right after he got hired. And so essentially... The decision had already been made before he came on board. Now, years later, knowing how that event had ongoing reverberations still in the church family, he proposed that they have a worship service of repentance to bear with one another, forgive one another. You know what the response was? numerous members of the congregation pushed back so hard about this idea that the church leaders decided to call off the worship service. It didn't happen. Then COVID hit and shut down and quarantine and they still haven't had it. People were so overcome by their negative emotions, they couldn't face the past. That's a sign of immaturity. That's the opposite of bearing with one another and forgiving one another. My family and I have been a part of Faith Church for long enough that we have heard some of the grievances that some of you have had with one another in the past. And some of it was before we started here in 20, uh, 2002. And quite frankly, sometimes over the past 19 years, You've had grievances with me. I've had grievances with a few of you. It's hard to talk about this, isn't it? It's easy for me sitting here in an empty sanctuary to a camera. I wonder how it will be in a live audience. Will it feel uncomfortable that I'm mentioning this? People leave churches because of grievances with one another or because of grievances with the leaders, grievances with the pastor. It's happened here too. We have not always practiced bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Brokenness in a church family is the result. And it just might be because we have not fully put on the clothing of compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness and patience. I sometimes wonder if we ought to have a public confession to address these grievances. Sometimes wonder if the hurts from the past linger, if the wounds have not been healed. And in so doing, I wonder if we have allowed immaturity to fester. Now, the general human tendency, I think our, our natural reaction, is to sweep things under the rug and just to say, time will heal all wounds. And time helps, no doubt about it. Uh, the emotions simmer down. Uh, we don't feel the tension quite like we did. But that doesn't mean that things are dealt with. Time does not automatically heal wounds. Now, why do I bring all this up? It's because of what Paul says next. Love. Love. 
we put on the clothing of love. And let's read again how he says it. Over all these virtues, he says, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is the epitome of how we are to relate to one another. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to be best friends with one another. In a, in a smaller church, sometimes I think we get that feeling that we're small enough, we should have a close relationship with everyone or we should know everyone. And that's just simply not true. I don't think it's physically possible to be best friends with more than maybe a couple people. Uh, some people are more capable of that, some people far less, and that's okay. And yet, sometimes I hear that there are cliques in the church, and particularly about maybe our Sunday school classes are a clique, or our small groups are a clique. Here's the thing. We can love one another well and still have closer relationships with a few people. That's natural. But if we want to be welcoming in love, then we will need to be flexible with our relationships, opening up space in our hearts and minds for, for more people. Imagine if God brought us a, a hundred new people, doubling the size of our church. What will it look like for us to practice love and welcoming them in? Well, our previous relationships are going to have to change, and that's okay. It's okay when a relationship changes in its level. There's nothing wrong with relationships changing levels. How many of you are still close friends with your high school friends? When I was in high school, I could not imagine not being close with those people. I love them. My relationships were great. Now maybe two of them are acquaintances, and that's it. Rarely do we talk. And I miss that. I wish we could be closer. Or, or even my wedding party. I had eight guys in my wedding party. The only people I, I talk to on a regular basis, these are the guys that are supposed to be my closest friends and that, that I would invite to be a part of my wedding, are my brother, my friend Chris, and my friend Dan. And that's it. The others, distant acquaintances. You know what? That's okay. Relationship levels change. It's not wrong. What is not okay is when we don't show love to one another. Love is active care. Not emotional feeling, but active care. Last week in, in Sunday school, David was teaching about 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and the unity in the church. It got me thinking. I even mentioned this in Sunday school. Faith church, we are a church of Republicans and Democrats, progressives and conservatives, old and young, men and women. We should love one another despite our differences. Take a look back at verses 10 and 11. We are the people who have put on this new self. We are part of a new family that is defined by Christ. We are in Christ, Paul writes. Nothing divides us, not ethnicity, not skin color, because we're all in Christ. And here Paul reminds us that love is what binds us together. It brings unity. And he has a very specific application for us as we love one another in verse 15. He says, let peace rule. We put on the clothing of peace. We are members of, of one body and we are called to peace and to become thankful for it. So how does a church put on this clothing of what we might call the clothing of peaceful love? Paul gives us four principles to follow. First, in verse 16, we put on the clothing of peaceful love when the word of Christ dwells in us richly or abundantly is another way to translate that. Well, how do we do that? You have to remember that when Paul wrote this, he was talking to people that did not have a Bible. None of them. So how did they have the word of Christ dwell in them abundantly? I mean, what is this word of Christ? Is he, he can't be talking about the Bible because it didn't exist, right? The Old Testament did, of course. Is that what he's talking about? I think he's talking about something more. He's talking about teaching of Christ. Teaching that we read like in this particular letter that he was sending to them. It's the teaching that would become part of the Bible in the New Testament. But he's talking about the teachings of Jesus that Jesus himself communicated. 
It was communicated by the other apostles, by church leaders and pastors. It's the teaching of the kingdom of God, the teaching of the way of Jesus, how to live like he lived. So how does that word dwell in us abundantly? Those first Christians could not get out their Bibles. Uh, They couldn't get out a phone or a laptop computer and read on the internet. They had to use their minds to remember, to think about the teaching and how they would apply it to their lives. It was an intentional effort for them to remember, to think about it, and consider how to live it. Now, you and I have access to the Bible And what a wonderful privilege, then, we have of studying it. This is an amazing gift. We can do it on our own. We can do it together. And so we should read it and and ponder it to this idea of what is called biblical meditation. You hear that a lot in the Old Testament, where we give deep thinking about the teaching of the Word of God so that we can apply it to our lives. We have the privilege where we can memorize it. We can discuss it with others. This should not just be a solo practice, but a community collaborative practice. That's why small groups are really important, whether it's Sunday school classes or uh, in-home small groups that we have. Each and every one of us should be discussing how to live out the word of God in our lives. That's the first way Paul says that we put on the clothing of peaceful love. Secondly, he says, we do this when we teach and admonish one another with wisdom. Clearly, that's related to having the word of Christ dwell in us richly, right? But notice, he really emphasizes teaching and admonishing. Now, in Paul's day, because there was no Bible to dwell on, the teaching was critical. It was the primary way that people were exposed to the word of Christ. Now, our situation, very different. We have tons of access to the Word of God and to teaching. And so that's why I think it's important for us to think about how this relates to the concept of discipleship. We're not just talking here about getting content, getting information or data. We don't want to be able to to just be good at playing Bible trivia. What we're talking about here is having uh, a person or groups of people to mentor us, to help us, to teach us and guide us and admonish us in how to actually live the kingdom way in our real lives. This is why participating in Christian community and gatherings on a regular basis, being intentional about it is so vital. Yes, that's participation in Sunday mornings, but it should go beyond that to small groups and Sunday school classes. Why? Because we need admonishing That word we don't use a whole lot. Here's what it means. To advise someone concerning the dangerous consequences of some happening or action. That's a warning. Paul is saying that when we gather, we are opening up our lives to the truth. We are opening up our lives to one another and how the truth relates to us. We're opening up our lives so that we might be able to receive loving correction and warning from one another. This requires that we are present with one another. Uh, Face-to-face, in person is best. Thankfully, we have other forms of communication in our day and age. Paul was doing it in a letter. He was using that technology, and, and we can too. If asked, though, all of us should be able to answer Here is the person, or this is the name of the person that I open my life up to, that I am willing, that I'm able to confess to. This is the person who knows the truth about me. And this is when we met, and this is what we talked about. This is the person who can confront me, and I humbly receive from them. Next, Paul says, we put on the clothing of peaceful love when we sing with gratitude Musical worship is important. It taps into our emotions. Singing helps set our hearts and minds on things above. It's one reason why we include musical worship in our our Sunday morning gatherings every single week. Now, you can do it throughout the week as well. Listen to worship when you drive or in your home, in your office. 
Um, I use Spotify. I love listening to music. Actually, lately, I've been listening to a lot of Johnny Cash. I love podcasts as well. Here's the thing I've noticed, though. There is no end to podcasts and TV shows and books and movies and articles and, and so on. There's so much content out there, it is literally impossible to keep up. And so that means we really have to pick and choose what we fill our minds with. Let the word dwell in you abundantly. Sing with gratitude in your hearts. Paul is encouraging us to praise God and fill our minds with the things of God. Fourth, we put on the clothing of peaceful love when whatever we do, we do it in the name of Jesus. Now, when I read this particular list here in verse 16, I was kind of tempted to think that Paul was kind of just talking about a worship service. There's Bible, there's preaching, there's singing. Then I came to verse 17 and it just expanded everything to all of life. We are not to just simply relegate our, our spiritual lives or our relationship with God to a church service. It's not just a thing that we check off the list as if that's all that God cares about. Paul says in whatever we do, whether it's the words we use, the deeds we do, 24-7, we do it all in the name of Jesus. So that's at home that's in front of our screens, at school, at work, on the sports field, in our neighborhoods, in our cars, every single place we go, every single thing we do. We make all of it an act of worship. doesn't matter the time of day. doesn't matter the activity. We seek with our hearts and we focus our minds on things above. So in closing, I want to ask, are you intentionally putting on the clothing of peaceful love? Are there any of these pieces of clothing that we've talked about that you need to work on adding to your life? I encourage you to talk about it with someone. That's where it starts. Sermons can only go so far. So admit what is lacking in your life. Confess it to God, then confess it to others. Repent, which means restoring a relationship with God and others. It means a change. What clothing do you need to add to your life? Yes, it can be work. Laundry is work, but it's good work. It's necessary. It is vital for the flourishing of ourselves and the church. Imagine what it would look like if Christians were known as the people who put on the clothing of peaceful love. Lord, we thank you for this reminder. We admit it's not easy, though. We struggle taking off the old clothes of the sinful nature and putting on these wonderful new clean clothes. We struggle, and we need your help. Thank you so much for your forgiveness your grace and mercy. Fill us, Holy Spirit, that we might be able to become more and more like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. As always, if you'd like to learn more about Faith Church, we encourage you to visit our website, findfaithhere.org. Uh, feel free to be in touch with us. We'd love to communicate further. Thank you so much for listening today.